Now we will deal with the topic that God has given us. And the topic is the topic of standing firm. Standing firm. While there were a lot of scriptures that talk about standing firm, and we were tempted to deal with those talking about standing in Christ, not standing in yourself, but standing in Christ. We would have talked about standing in faith, uh, would have talked about standing on the word of God. But God, in his wisdom, felt that we should talk about the three tenses of salvation. Past tense, we were saved. Present, present tense, I am saved. Future tense, I will be saved. These three tenses are interrelated. You will not be saved in the future if you are, if you are not saved at present. You will not be saved at present if you were not saved in the past. So they are interrelated. Your being saved in the past determines your being saved presently. Your being saved presently and continuously so determines your being saved in the future. When someone gets saved, we often assure them that they will go to heaven, which is not a wrong thing. But going to heaven is not automatic. You, do, you don't go to heaven because we are saved in the past. You go to heaven because you continued to be saved until the day you died. You died in the Lord. Then you can make it to heaven. Now let me remind you then the two tenses we talked about. And IT will help us to open a new page and then mention the things we'll be mentioning in revision on a new page. Past tense, the scripture is Ephesians 2 verse 8. By grace, you have been saved. Um, Titus uh, chapter 2 verses 11 no chapter 3 chapter 3 verses 3 to 7 talks about salvation in the past two things are important when we talk about salvation in the past one is the issue of the penalty of the sins you have committed. If you are not saved in the past, you will account for every sin you have committed and you will be judged for those sins. So salvation in the past deals with the penalty of sins, which when you are saved, the penalty is removed. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ himself speaks about this lack of condemnation. Um, I'm not sure whether it is chapter 5, which says they've passed from death, and they've entered into life. Um, let's go to chapter 3 
and see if it is this chapter that talks about having passed from death to life. Is it 336, I think? Whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son of God will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. But I want a verse that says they have passed from death to life. To show that there's no judgment, there's no penalty. Uh, Christ paid the penalty of the sins of those who have committed their lives to him. Uh, John 5.24, let's look at that at John 5 and verse 24. See what it says. It says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. He won't be condemned crossed over from death to life. King James Version, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. So the issue is the penalty of sin. I want to stress that. Uh, you are not judged. There, there is no penalty you will face. And the second word that is important is the word of justification. Romans 5 verses 9 and 10. Since therefore we are now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now, that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So it deals with justification. Justification, we said, means you are not guilty. You are not guilty. You are acquitted. You are set free. You are absolved of your accountability for sin. So two words that are important concepts with salvation of the first. One, penalty for sin removed. Two, Justification, acquittal. Then we came then to the second tense of salvation, namely the present tense. The present tense. And we gave two scriptures, 2 Corinthians 2.15, which says we are being saved. We are being saved. We are not perishing. That was the second part. We read 
also 1 Corinthians 1 18 which says also we are being saved first one was second Corinthians 2 50 we are being saved now being means it connotes the idea of continuity. We are being saved. Now, what is important for us to know, very important for us to know, is that the Christ who saves us, no, the Christ who saved us does not leave us alone. After he saved us, he protects us from falling. He saved us, he continues to save us. That's important. That's important. Now, the present tense deals with the power of sin. After we are saved, does sin have power over us? That's the question. Are we overpowered by sin after we have been saved? That is the question we are asking. We are not dealing with the issue of the penalty of sin, but we are dealing with the issue of the power of sin. Does sin have power over us? And the answer is that if you are correctly saved, then sin has no power over you. God strengthens you and you have got power over sin. I remember a young person who came to see me who was a student, a young lady. She told me how she was in love with a young man who was not born again. And she went to see this young man <clears throat> in his place in the absence of adults. She told me that she does not know how she escaped how she did not commit fornication with this young man. And then she confessed that she knows that it was God who protected her. It's God who protected her. So God saved us and God continues to save us so that sin will have no power over us. What we need to do then is continue, continually say no to sin. Titus 2 verse 12. Say no. No to sin. Do so sternly, sternly, with firmness. No. Say no to sin. Secondly, don't give any part of your body to sin. Romans 6, 12 and 13. It's a strong verse particularly in NLT, particularly in NLT, it's very strong. Romans 6, verse 12 and 13, uh, it says something very important, which is worth repeating. Uh, verse 12 in NLT 
Do not let sin control the way you live. Don't let sin control the way you live. Do not give in. Do not give in to its lustful desires. Sin raises lusts. Don't give in. Thirteen, do not let any part of your body become a tool, a tool of wickedness to be used for sinning. Don't allow any part of your body to be used for sinning. Instead, give your whole body as a tool to do what is right and thereby glorify God. Now this part deals with the power of sin and the word that is used is the word sanctification sanctification, which means separation from everything in order to belong to God. It means to be holy. Anything separated for God's use is holy. So it deals with holiness. Then we mentioned that the word of God sanctifies you the Holy Spirit sanctifies you. Christ sanctifies you. And God the Father sanctifies you. Now we are dealing now with salvation, the future tense of salvation. The future tense. We were saved in the past. We are being saved in the present. We'll be saved in the future. And Acts 15 verse 11, we are giving you scriptures now concerning the future tense of salvation. But we believe that we shall be saved. We shall be saved. As future through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe we shall be saved. 15 verse 11. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the future. Romans 5 verse 9 is the future also. Romans 5 verse 9, since therefore we are now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved, future, shall we, we were saved, we we're justified, but we shall be saved by him through wrath. That's future tense. There are many other verses that speak of the future tense of salvation. Matthew 10 and verse 22 says, All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end he who stands firm, who does not give in to sin. The Bible says, shall stand, he, whoever shall stand firm to the end will in the future will be saved. Now, what does this verse deal with? This verse deals with the Presence of sin. Past tense, the power of sin. No, past tense, the penalty for sin. Present tense, the power of sin. Future tense, the presence of sin. First John 3 verse 6. 
1 John 3, verse 6. Whoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Neither known him. Now, some people have got a wrong understanding of this, of this tense, the future tense of sin. Let me explain the misunderstanding. Some people will teach you that it is not possible to live on earth without sinning. When they say that, they mean that the salvation that Christ brought us is woefully inadequate. That's what they mean. Christ saved us, but he really could not save us. We'll still have to live in sin. So they say that uh, you will sin until you die. And then the issue of stopping sinning will happen after death. It will happen when you see Christ and Christ shall, shall change you uh, to become a blameless, wrinkleless, a person. Now, the question they are dodging is this. How will you see Christ if you, you are in sin? They are dodging that. They say you'll see Christ because you were, you were saved. You are born again. Second question they are dodging is, if you are saved and you still live in sin, from what then have you been saved? That's the question. You have been saved from sin. You continue to live in sin. From what have you been saved? Because Matthew 121, Matthew 121, we shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Matthew 121 tells us that we are saved from sins. We are not saved in sins. Note the preposition. We are not saved in sins. We are saved from sins. Now, they don't understand that it is possible to live in this life without sinning. So you are saved from the presence of sin. Because you've been saved from the power of sin in the present tense. So if you are saved from the power of sin, it means you are saved also from the presence of sin. So sin will not be part of your life. Sin will be the thing of the past. A scripture that emphasizes this if we had time, we would have gone through it. Uh, very intensely. It is first John chapter three, verses five to ten. If you read that portion of scripture, first John chapter three, five to eighteen, no five to ten. It will tell you that one who is born again does not sin and cannot sin because the seed of God abides in him. He says here is the difference between those who are children of God and those who are not. The difference is that those who are children of God do not sin and those who are not God's children so do sin.
this speaks of the presence of sin. Where you are, sin is not present in you. No, it's not present. You will resist sin with all your might. Actually, with not all your might, with all his might. The presence of sin. It deals with that. Past tense, it deals with the penalty of sin. Present tense, deals with the power of sin. Future tense, deals with the presence of sin. Past tense, it deals with justification. Present tense, <clears throat> it deals with sanctification. And future tense, it deals with glorification. Deals with that glorification. Now, you will not be glorified you will not be glorified in the future if you are not glorified in the present tense. What does glorif glorification mean? Some people use all kinds of things to explain what glorification means. But it means to bear the glory of God. That's what it means. To be the carrier of the glory of God. And then this, the Bible says, that happens while you are here on earth. And I like the way it puts it. It says we are growing into this glorification from one level of growth, from one level of glory to another level. Oh, there are several levels of glorification as we grow in Christ and in the knowledge of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second, Corinthians uh, chapter 3 and verse 18 states this. Second Corinthians 3 and verse 18. It says, and we, who with unveiled faces, all reflect, all reflect the lost glory. Now this verse says the glory is not ours. We are reflectors of the glory of God. Where is this Lord? is resident in our lives. Because when you are saved, you receive Christ into your life to come and dwell in you. Now, when then there is glory in your life, this glory is a reflection of Christ who is in you. Oh, please note that. That statement I've made is very important. When there is glory that is seen out, outside of you, that glory does not emanate from you. That glory comes from Christ. It is the glory of Christ reflected on you. It is not your own glory which you have produced, but it is the glory of Christ who is in you. 
and this glory is reflected outwardly through you. Let me read that verse again. And we who with, uh, with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. We are reflectors of his glory. We are being transformed. Two words that are important so far, reflecting, re reflecting the glory of Christ who is in us. We are being transformed into his likeness. That's the second statement. We are being transformed into his likeness. Then it says, with ever increasing glory. That's important. This glory of Christ who is inside of us grows, is reflected outwardly, and the glory grows. If we had time, I would have explained that this glory is reflected as the outer body is broken. The outer body. Lee, Watchman Lee, explains the issue of the broken, broken outer man. Because outer man is like a veil and it hides Christ. And when the veil is removed, then Christ is seen in our mortal bodies. His glory is seen in us. Now this verse says, then this glory transforms us. Transforms us. It transforms us to look like Christ. The more we walk with Christ and the more we experience his salvation, we are every day becoming like Christ, transformed. And it says, with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. Ah, this glory that we are reflecting comes from the Lord. It does not come from us. It comes from the Lord who indwells us. And the Holy Spirit also indwells us. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? Second Corinthians says that. We have been transformed from one level of glory to the next level. <laughs> so we are transformed from one level of glory to the other. There are other scriptures, let me give them to you, we'll not read them that talks about this glory. Romans 8, verse 30. Maybe let's read it quickly. Romans 8, verse 30. It starts from 29 to 30. What does it say about the glory of God? It says in verse 29, of Romans 8, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What is skipped here 
is that those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he sanctified, and those he sanctified, he glorified. Three stages of salvation. Justification is the first stage. Sanctification is the second stage. Glorification is the third stage. The future tense of salvation. Second Thessalonians 1 and verse 10 is another scripture. We're not basing what we are learning from the word of God. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1 and verse 10 uh, says, On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have be believed, this includes you. Because you believed our testimony to you. Verse 12, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So I was praying that uh, these people will continue to bear the glory of Christ. They believed in Christ. Christ came into their lives. Their sins were forgiven. The penalty of sin was removed. The power of sin was nullified. Now these people continue to love Christ. And then they received Christ into their lives in the absence of the sinful nature, which is rooted out when someone believes that Christ died in order to remove the sinful nature. And then Christ lives in us, and he continues then to um, display his presence outwardly. And the glory of Christ is seen outwardly. Now, glorification means carrying the glorious life of Christ. What does it mean, glorification? You carry, I'm defining it. It means carrying the glorious life of Christ. And that life manifests in us and through us, through our mortal bodies. People can't see inside our spirits. They, they, they have no capacity to see. But they see, they see our outward behavior. And when, when they see our outward behavior, then they see that we're carrying Christ. They see the glory of Christ. Christ says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works they will glorify God who is in heaven. They will, they will see glory in you and thank God. I will show you two scriptures and then we shall close. One is John 17.22. Maybe you've never noticed this verse, but it is a very incredible verse. It is a very astounding 
Maybe let me use that word, astounding, surprising verse. It says, I have given them, Christ is talking to his father. You know that John 17 is his prayer. He's praying to the father, praying for many, many, many things. And in 22, he says to his father, I have given them the glory you gave me. Hey, isn't that amazing? He says, you, Father, you gave me glory. And I have given them the glory. So that's why the glory is seen, because I've given them the glory you gave me. That they may be one as we are one. Oh, the thing that connects you to God and makes you one is the glory. Is the glory. It makes you one with Christ and one with God. Because you are bearing the glory of the Father. The Father gave the glory to the Son and the Son gave the glory to you. So this glory connects you. And Christ says he has given us that glory. Whenever there's glory in you, you must know that this glory is not original with you. God has given you the glory. And the Christ who lives in you exudes that glory. That glory comes out if Christ is in you indeed. That's important. Now there's a verse which I will not have time to expound, but I pray that God will reveal the verse to you, these verses. There's no time to explain them fully. Second Corinthians uh, chapter four, verse seven, talking about manifesting Christ outwardly. It says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Verse 8 says, 7 to 10 to 12, it says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but are not crushed, we are perplexed, but not in despair, we are persecuted, but not abandoned, we are struck down, but not destroyed. Verse 10, we always carry around in our body the death of Christ, so that the life of Christ may be seen. The life of Christ may be seen. Where is it seen? this life of Christ, it may be revealed in our body, in our body. That's the future tense. When, when people will see the glory of God reflected through our physical bodies, and people see the glory of God. But because they don't know, they will think that this glory is your glory. They will think this glory emanates from you. They don't know that this glory is the glory of Christ who lives in you, and this glory is growing. Talks about then self having to die. on the cross with Christ, 
so that the life of Christ might then come in its fullness into our lives, into our lives. And this glory of Christ, which has come inside of us, is growing, is growing. This verse continues to say, we always verse carry in our bodies the death of Christ so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our bodies, in our body. For we who are alive are always given over to death for Jesus' sake. So that his life may be revealed, may be revealed. His life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. Now the point I want to make then without belaboring it is that once you receive Christ, there's glory in Christ whom you have received. As you grow in the knowledge of the Lord, this glory which is inside of you begins to reflect outwardly. And people can see this glory of Christ. And then the Bible says that We carry this treasure, which is the glory of God, in our earthen vessels. So we are given to death, the death of self, that we have died to self. And then the Bible says, then the glory of Christ, or Christ himself will be seen in us and through us, in our mortal bodies. Now, there are many other verses then that talk about this glory of Christ and how it happens to grow in us and through us. In conclusion, three tenses. Past tense, saved from, uh, we were saved. Present tense, we are being saved. Future tense, we will be saved. Past tense, save from the power of sin. No, from the penalty of sin. Present tense, save from the power of sin. Future tense, saved from the presence of sin. Theological terms that are used, past tense were justified, justification. Present tense, sanctified. Sanctification. Future tense, glorified. Glorification. And God wants us to have all three. The ultimate is the last one. The absence of sin in our lives is the, is the ultimate. And when we are taken to heaven where there is no sin, when we are totally, totally moved from the presence of sin when we come to heaven. Now, these three tenses contribute to our standing firm. If we have been saved from the penalty of sin, there's a history of us being saved. Then we have established the rock on which we stand. Firm. And the rock is our salvation. Actually, Christ is our salvation, is the rock. Our lives are built on the rock. So we can stand firm. The winds, the floods, the storms will come to us. They will leave us standing because we are standing on the rock. We were saved from the penalty of sin, established on the rock. 
We are saved in the presence. And in the presence from the power of sin, we are sanctified. The word of God sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. Our Lord Jesus Christ sanctifies us. And God himself sanctifies us. Oh, Christ is very interested. The triune God is interested in us overpowering the power of sin. So they are really serious in the present tense of our, of our salvation. Because the present tense of our salvation guarantees the future tense. We will not be saved in the future if we don't remain saved presently. So the God who saved us in the past, Christ, continues to strengthen us in the present to forget to overcome the power of sin. So we stand firm. We are working out our salvation so that others may see it. Then we'll be saved in the future when we'll be taken away from this world to heaven in a place where there is no sin. But that begins while we're on earth. When in the presence of sin, surrounded by sin, surrounded by sin, but insulated from sin, Christ insulates us from sin. And we bear the glory of Christ. This Christ who is in us reflects outwardly through our bodies. And this glory grows, which means the reflection of Christ in us grows. The more we grow in Christ is the more we reflect him. Until one day, we will see him face to face. Question, are you being saved from sin? Another question, is sin present in your life? Have you been separated from sin? And have you been insulated from sin penetrating into you? Are you bearing the glory of Christ? Do people see Christ in you? I've heard stories of people who met in a restaurant. They did not know each other. And one lady, a white lady, comes to a black lady and says, are you saved? She says, yes, I'm saved. I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. In a restaurant, this lady said, I saw Christ in you. And the black lady sa says, I've been watching you too. I saw Christ in you. Beautiful. When Christ is seen in you, is Christ seen in you? Are you reflecting him? Is that reflection of the glory of Christ growing? Will you one day be taken to a place where there is no sin? Because God insulated you from sin and you you yourself constantly said no to sin. If you undergo these three stages of salvation, you will stand firm. Is Ndombizandile in? Is she still in or not? Can we find out? She is in, Dada. Can you ask her to pray for us? Please pray for us. Can we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, we want to thank you so much for what you are teaching us. We are grateful that you are not setting us up for failure, 
you don't want us to miss out on experiencing your complete salvation because you did say that indeed you are able to save us to the uttermost. So mm. we are really, really grateful that you want us to appropriate full salvation. So we're really praying for each and every one of us that where there are shortfalls or there are missing elements, Please enlighten those to us and grant us the humility to just come to you and ask you to grant us the faith to be able to take hold of the full portion that you've got for us of your salvation. So we're grateful a lot that in these challenging times we're living in, you still want us to stand firm and to continue standing um, on Christ. You don't want us to be on a shaken ground. Um, we understand that you are preparing us for what lies ahead, for the tabulous times that we are likely to experience into our future. But we are grateful that we've been equipped. So we will not lay hold on you, we will not say you have failed us, you did not fail us, you pr truly properly prepared us. We are just going to ask for grace, that you grant us the grace to not forget what you taught us, Grant us the grace to lay hold of it, deepen it in our hearts, yeah. so that in the name of Jesus Christ, we are able to stand firm, raise a crop amongst us who are able to hear this truth, set us apart from those that don't know this truth, make it evident in our lives. We are so grateful for having such a caring Father. We are grateful God, for the Holy Spirit, we are grateful for Christ, we're grateful that you've deposited the whole Trinity just to assist us so that we stand firm. We really, really appreciate the salvation that you've called us unto, that it's a complete, complete salvation. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen. Amen. We can close the recording now.